Come, Father God. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and minds that which you teach us this day. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to please come forward. Getting in trouble bothers you. Read. School bothers you. Maggie? Your little sister and brother bother you. Ansley? My brother. Your brother. Brothers or brother? Brother. Brothers. Okay. Natalie? Same thing. Her brothers. Yeah, you two are right in the same boat, aren't you? Uh, Bradley? <laughs> and yeah, yeah, everybody's pointing at their sibling. Charlotte, anything other than your siblings bother you? Your brother? He's just a little baby. He hits me with his trucks. He hits you with his trucks. That would bother you. All right. Drew? What bothers you, buddy? The only thing that bothers you is, is once you what? You rage on a game. Yeah, and also my brother. Too. And also your brother. And he gets me in all kinds of fights. Your brother gets you in all kinds of fights and stuff. Wow. So yeah, sibling stuff is pretty big as we go along. So so what do you do? What do you do about that? What do you do about it when your brother's bothering you? Or your sister's bothering you? What do you do about it when your brothers are bothering you? I walk away. You walk away. What do you do about it? Maggie, you shout at them to get out of your room. Ansley, you take your refuge. What did you say, Bradley? Sometimes she does what? You do shout at them. Yeah, just. Yeah. Well, did you? Now, what about school? What do you What do you do about school, Reed? You suffer through it. <laughs> and Lily? Um, I ask for my parents to help. You ask for your parents to help. Okay. Well, so when you think about, I appreciate your, your candor and honesty very much. Because that's real stuff. I grew up with, I had an older brother and three little sisters. And things were not often very smooth around the house with us either. <laughs> And so you react in these different ways. You might shout, you might retreat, you might. But what does is, what is Jesus ask us to do? What does Jesus command us to do to deal with all of that? Yes? To pray. To pray. And what happens when you pray? What? God listens. God listens. And does your, maybe your heart and mind start getting pulled a little bit in a more constructive manner, right? Yeah. Bryce? What bugs you, buddy? Mm. What? I said I don't know. He says he don't know. He's very, very good. Clyde, what bugs you? My sister. Your sister. Yeah, so really, now, here's the thing. <laughs> uh, how many sisters do you have? Two. In the whole world, seven billion people, only two of them are your sisters. <laughs> that makes them very rare and precious, doesn't it? And only one is my, and I only have one sibling. And you only have one brother. Yeah, which yeah. I don't even see that And one. you only have one sister and I, one brother. I'd be sure I have a lot of cousins, but I barely see them. Okay. Barely see them. Barely see those cousins, okay. Yeah, so but what Jesus wants us to do is, is don't get, respond to getting provoked. You know what being provoked is? 
Let me just demonstrate it. Ah, there you go. So that bugged you, didn't it? Yeah, did that bug you? Yeah. Does that bug you? I can be really annoying if I want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me my Bradley. I know you're good at it. Yeah. But what? But but one of the things God wants from us is to don't respond to being provoked and poked. And don't let that tempt you into be, into sinning yourself. You understand? That's a big deal, isn't it? To hold, to keep your cool, to 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 and to, to try to maybe separate the stimulus and the response a little bit, and try to respond in the right way. I mean, Henry is how old is he? Two, almost, almost two on the on St. Patrick's Day, right? Yeah. So if he's coming at you with the truck. Your, your job is to teach him to not do that. And that means that, yeah, you don't have to sit there and take it, but you've got to be part of the plan of him learning not to hit people with trucks. Because if he goes, like if he goes on his first job and he walks in there with a toy truck and hits his boss, <laughs> he's going to be out of there. So he's got to learn not to do that. So you've got to help him. And so by God's grace, he will. You guys like that? Okay. So yeah, so just remember not to be so provoked to make you sin. All right? Can we pray about that? The congregation, please help us. Dear God, Dear God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much. For loving us so much. For loving us so much. And the ways, dear Lord. And the ways, dear Lord. You put up with us. You put up with us. We pray, dear God, and we pray, dear God, that you would help us, that you would help us to respond thoughtfully, to respond thoughtfully, carefully, carefully, and lovingly, and lovingly when the world provokes us, when the world provokes us, or even the devil, or even the devil. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. What you say? I up something in there in the middle of prayer. What you say? Okay. All right. Everybody, get up. A long weekend, so yeah, you go. Good job. Maybe I should have just asked him which one of your brothers and sisters bothers you the most. <laughs> so, uh, once upon a time, a few years ago, in another place far, far away, we uh, we lived in our neighborhood, and, and we had our, our beautiful black lab, Lucy, and, and I was in the routine of walking Lucy around the block every evening. And, uh, and there was this interesting spot on our walk around the block, and there was a house on the other street across the way that they had uh, three Pomeranians. <laughs> now, does anybody here own a Pomeranian? <laughs> Okay, we'll be very careful not to offend. Um, those of you who don't know what a Pomeranian is, imagine a five to seven pound dust mop with no handle. <laughs> and that barks nonstop. Now, as we come around the block to this house, it, it had a chain link fence in the backyard, and, uh, and these dogs, they would see us coming down the street and they would get up at that fence and they would just bark, 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 bark like mad. The three of them going just absolutely bonkers, barking at us. Uh, our, our lab, Lucy, she didn't even notice them, didn't pay them a bit of attention, but I did. <laughs> they, would, uh, they would come unglued, their eyes bulging. All three of them barking as though the very existence of the planet depended upon them. And so, and then this is what they do. We, we come by their house, and, uh, and, and I'd be walking by, and, and they'd bark, 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 bark. And then as we started passing by the house, they would run around to the other side and bark, 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 bark. <laughs> so, uh, one day I decided to play a trick on and here's the trick. So I, we, they come to the first part, and they bark, bark, bark around on that side of the house. Then they run around the back side, and they bark, bark, bark on that side. Then I would turn around and uh, take about three steps as though I'm going the other way. And they'd run back around to the other side. And then I'd scurry on until I got past the next house, and they couldn't see me anymore. So I just vanished from their sight. <laughs> 
And uh, here's the thing. That was fun. <laughs> and from that time on, I would do that every time. <laughs> and they'd fall for it every time. <laughs> and isn't that how temptation works? Now, when we think about temptation, we can think about there's really kind of two uh, sources of our temptation, two sources of, of our sin. And uh, one, of course, is very much internal. And it just comes down to the ways that we are wired with our appetites and our desires that much of those rooted in our natural tendencies towards survival and preservation. But there's also an external factor. And as we heard the kids so readily confess, you can be provoked by all manner of external uh, circumstances and people. And um, in one sense, you know, I think about how easily I provoked those Pomeranians and how easy they fall, fall for my trick every time. Now, there is a lesson for us in that we should not be so easily provoked, right? Or I have to be honest with myself and recognize that their barking tempted me to tease them. And that, in that, you see, the external stimulus awakened the thing inside me because I'm a terrible tease, right? And, uh, and then I fall for that every time. Now, I'm sure the dogs have gotten over it by now. I don't know if I have. So, what did Luke think? I think about when we come into this moment with Jesus and his temptation by, by the devil. You think about why, why is this in the gospel? Why did Luke include this in his gospel? Matthew also includes a very extensive account of this, this moment. Mark barely mentions it at all, and John doesn't include it in his gospel. And I got thinking about it, and I thought, well, the only real source for this has to be Jesus himself. And since Luke uh, wasn't one of the original disciples, he must have heard that from the other disciples, that Jesus must have related this story to them about it as he was preparing them for their ministry for the task of representing him and sharing the good news after he was gone. Because Jesus knew that they were going to face hardships. And they were going to face many of the same hardships that he faced. And that would include ridicule and shunning, persecutions and indifference, and they would face temptations. Jesus was led, Mark says, driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, also known as Satan. And Jesus was engaged in this battle from the start. And his disciples had to engage it. And so must we. Now I want to pause here and note that Jesus is in effect in this moment. You know, we talk about Jesus, he talked about himself as fulfilling the scriptures. Well, one of the ways in which he's fulfilling the scriptures is that he's 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 fulfilling the, the conflict that Job had with Satan. And that is a story that is way old. It is older than Judaism. It's, it's the oldest book in the Bible chronologically from when we understand the stories arose. And, uh, and it may be the old, it's among the oldest pieces of human literature altogether. And so I want to share with you a little excerpt from that story of Job that will kind of help us hone in on, uh, on what's, what's going on with Jesus in this moment. If you turn to page 417 in the Bibles there in your pews, I'm going to pick up chapter 2 at verse 1, read verses 1 through 6. Page 417, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And just to give you the setup, at this point, uh, God has already let Satan take away, uh, wipe out all of Job's children, all of his cattle, all of his, uh, his possessions. He's lost everything except his wife and his physical health. And then he would pick up the story. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. 
And Satan also came among them to present himself to, before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. Now that passage, the whole story of Job, uh, raises a most difficult and one of the kind of the original. If you think about how old this is, it raises one of the most difficult and original questions of faith, which is why does God allow Satan, the accuser, to afflict people, especially good people? And do you see the challenges? That there's an implicit challenge in just that. Because even asking that question, which we are free to do, that tempts us to judge God. Well, we're trying to figure God out and see if we approve. But Job refuses to do that. Although in just a few more verses, his wife tells him, why don't you just curse God and die? Now Job refuses to do that, although he does want to know why. Don't we all? In God's response, we may find a bit unsatisfying because he says, where were you when I formed the world and everything in it? He's essentially telling him, who are you to question me? A good point. Now that's a whole other sermon, which I am happy to preach, but I imagine you have things to do today. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, I want, I want us to focus on its ancient witness to our old enemy. And how Jesus faces him for us. Now here's a pop quiz for you. How many temptations did Jesus face in the wilderness? Now you did a lot better than the 8 o'clock crew. Because they all shouted out three. Kathy says 368. Well, what we do know is that it's, the, the passage says that, that Jesus was out there for 40 days and 40 nights and, 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 the, uh, and he was continuously tempted. So we don't really know how many. Uh, but, and, then, and then Satan does wrap it up with these final three. So when you think about all those other temptations, what were they about? Well, well we don't even know. And maybe that isn't so important. Because we each have our own particular set of weaknesses and buttons that can be pushed. We might share some of those in common. Like, you know, the kids all seem to have seen siblings, they kind of struggle with them, right? We have a lot that we have in common. But this struggle really unfolds uniquely for each of us. We are all wired differently. And we are all at different points on our own journeys through life. The three that Luke does list each pound the same point home. When he challenges Jesus to turn stones to bread, this isn't merely about a famished man's desire for food. Now, if you just take a look outside, you will, any, any window at your house, you look outside here and you'll see uh, you know, your grass and trees and bushes and roads and sidewalks, that kind of thing. And, you know, we're supposed to get some rain maybe over the next couple of days. So there'll be a little more green for us, which is great. But you look outside the window and or go anywhere in Israel, and what do you see? Rocks. I mean, the whole place is rocks. Sand. Right? It's all rocks. Not entirely, but, but, you know, there's just a lot of rocks there. And, uh, and so here's the thing. If Jesus got into that habit of turning stones into, into bread, then he could solve world hunger in an instant, right? Be all taken care of. And, uh, or better yet, with a word, he could end all human suffering in a word. 
The problem with that is that it would only meet our temporal needs, only for this life. And what people really need is, well, let me share with you the full verse that he references in his response, which is Deuteronomy 8.3. He humbled you by letting, your, letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, which, which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In other words, the temporal need being met by the bread is, is one thing, and we all hunger for that, but the real issue is our relationship with the Lord. And so responding to Satan to just take care of the temporal is a very subtle snare. When Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world, the temptation is what many of us probably desire right now. Like, dear God, would you just end that war? Right, just end it. God, could you just turn their hearts and make it stop? And if Jesus were in charge of all the kingdoms of the world, he could end war, he could end strife, he could end injustice and cruelty. But at what cost? The cost of kneeling before the ruler of this world, which is Satan. And of course, that would violate the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, anything, anything, anything that we place ahead of God is going to create a huge, huge burden for us and a block between us and God. And for the third temptation of testing God's faithfulness to Jesus' person and testing Jesus' faith in him, Satan actually quotes a couple of verses from Psalm 91. So he's actually using scripture to try and trip Jesus up. And it all really comes down to the core issue that we all face, which is my will be done versus thy will be done. And that is the issue, following God or following anyone or anything else. Now, Yes, God allowed Satan to tempt Jesus those 40 days. But really, he kept tempting him all the way through to the cross. Those three temptations are always there. I mean, when Jesus is out there feeding the 5,000, why stop at 5,000? When Jesus heals somebody, why stop there? I mean, he could have opened the most abundant food bank ever. He could have opened the first medical clinic ever and just healed everyone. He could have overthrown Rome, those dreaded occupiers, with a word. Instead, he remained obedient to his father's will all the way to the cross. Until he said from the cross, I thirst. And forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. So our lesson for this first Sunday of Lent among those lessons is, you know, this whole season of Lent, it really starts with Ash Wednesday, of course, and, and the Ash Wednesday liturgy pounds this point home, which is a great theme of Lent, and one that we must attend to, which is that it's a, a large part working on ourselves. That we take things up, we, we fast from other things, and uh, with Jesus' help and the power of the Holy Spirit to try to make some progress towards being the people that God's calling us to be out of internal reception of Him. That is important. We are, each of us, an ongoing project in that regard. But do not discount or neglect the presence of the evil one, that external source of temptation, that embodiment of evil in Satan is very real. And as Peter wrote in his letter, prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. We've all got serious work to do. And we, and we can easily look at all the awful cruelty and evil in this world to remind us he is always at it, always at us. So be aware, be warned. Don't let him find a foothold 
in your hand. Don't let him find a foothold in your anger. Don't let him find a foothold, a foothold in your weariness. Don't let him needle in on your resentments and your envies. Don't let him prey upon your unmet needs or your frustrations or your disappointments. Don't ever listen to his lies that God isn't there or that God doesn't care or that he won't be there for you. Don't ever let him drive a wedge between you and God or between you and the people that he has placed in your life. And always remember that this battle is won. You are sealed and marked as Christ's own forever. Satan has been overthrown. So don't ever give in to the despair. Cling to Jesus. Listen carefully for God's direction. Study his word. And always, always, always pray. Thy will be done. Amen. Amen.